you know, probably the biggest question that I was getting, and it's still happening in the industry is why do we take calves away from cows? And so that sort of led a, a couple of us here uh, to uh, get funding for a project to compare calves that were raised on cows in, in a dairy herd to calves that were raised individually, pair housed calves, as well as group housed calves. So we sort of wow. wanted to do it all and <laughs> <laughs> see what would happen. Welcome back to another episode of the Dairy Podcast Show. My name is Barry Bradford from Michigan State University, and I have the honor today of welcoming Dr. Brad Hines to the show. Dr. Hines is a professor in the Department of Animal Science at the University of Minnesota. Dr. Hines finished his BS, his MS, and his PhD, all from the University of Minnesota, and shortly after completing his doctorate, joined the faculty there uh, and rose through the ranks uh, till he's now an, a full professor. So he's been on faculty uh, since 2010. Um, in the past, he has actually worked as a dairy farmer. He's worked in uh, marketing and PR for Worldwide Sires. Um, and he has a, a bit of a mix of his educational background, including a, a minor during his graduate program in statistics. So with that, Dr. Hines, thanks so much for joining us today. Yeah, thanks for, uh, thanks for having me on, Barry. I'd like to learn a little bit more about your background. So did, did you grow up on a dairy or how did you get into this space? So I, I grew up with registered jerseys. Okay. And, you know, I, I was involved in showing in 4-H, was on dairy judging team and FFA. And, you know, that sort of got my interest in genetics with all the registration papers and sure. cows that were scored. So uh, that's what really sparked my interest, I guess. I owe it all to the Jersey cow. There you go. <laughs> and if I understand right, your your graduate work was primarily focused in genetics. Is that correct? Right? That's right. So I I did my degrees at the University of Minnesota, and I I worked with uh, Les Hansen and worked with crossbreeding of dairy cows. We actually did all of our research in California. So I was in California a lot as a grad student, working with seven farms there that were doing some crossbreeding. So I got I got to know you know, the California dairy industry uh, quite a bit, even when I worked out there um, versus even in grad school. And uh, looking through your, your sort of work history, did you, um, did you go into the private sector for a while before coming back to graduate school? So yeah, after, after my undergraduate, I, I worked for Worldwide Sires in, in California uh, for a few months and worked in uh, marketing and PR. So I you know, had a lot of foreign visitors coming to California. And so I took them around to farms. Uh, I took them to many different places in California as well. You know, we went to Yosemite National Park as well. Nice. Um, and, you know, showed uh, these guests daughters of bulls as well as uh, what California has to offer. So I I got quite immersed in the California livestock industry. So it was a, it was a fun time. I really enjoyed it. And you know, working for a genetics company sort of kind of sealed my fate, I guess, uh, <laughs> in the genetics world. And uh, that's what really got me excited to come and work on my uh, master's degree in, in animal breeding and genetics. I didn't mention in the introduction, but um, you don't actually, you're not working based out of the Twin Cities. You're at the West Central Research and Outreach Center in Morris, Minnesota. Uh, I've never been there. I'm sure many of our listeners haven't seen that. Tell me a little bit about what that center is all about, what it all encompasses, and then what your programs are there specifically in your program. Sure. So even though I'm I'm faculty in the Department of Animal Science, there are, are some faculty in, in our college that work out state. We have actually 11 research and outreach centers in, in Minnesota. Wow. Yeah. They're kind of faced... You know, you know, they were old egg experiment stations, I guess, if some people want to call them that, uh, that, that that's sort of the old term. Um, but our, at our facility in, in Morris, we've had a dairy herd here since 1910. <laughs> so it's been a long time. And so we focus on dairy. Uh, there's swine here. We have 
two colleagues in, uh, that are studying swine nutrition and behavior. We also have a, a renewable energy program uh, where we have uh, wind turbines, uh, we have lots of solar, uh, we have a world-class wind to ammonia plant. So we can produce anhydrous ammonia with wind power here and electrolyze water. That's there, it's kind of a very hot topic right now. Mm -hmm. And then we have some horticulture um, with flowers and a, a lot of different things there. So we have a, um, a about a thousand acres here uh, with crops uh, and pasture for our dairy herd. So we have quite a big uh, research center uh, here with, with lots of different things going on uh, besides the dairy. Um, and our dairy herd here is about 300 cows. Okay. So we're um, predominantly pasture based in the summertime, confinement in the, in the winter, uh, you know, depending on the year. L last year it was, seemed like we were in confinement a lot earlier with some droughts here, but uh, we try to pasture our cows, uh, pasture our heifers as well. So everything is raised from birth uh, till they leave here. So it's uh, quite an operation with well over 600 head of dairy animals here. A lot to manage. And exactly. correct me if I'm wrong, but my perception at least is that's where you house this population of cows that has been maintained with 1960s genetics versus a, a modern selected herd. Is that right? So, uh, so they were here. They, they left about a year ago. So they're actually in the St. Paul campus herd right now, about 20 milking cows. We, they were here uh, when I started here. We maintained about 30 or 40 milking cows plus heifers, but they, they still exist. They've kept uh, it they, going. they exist. Some researchers in, in the Twin Cities wanted to do more sort of intensive stuff with, uh, you know, mastitis uh, and biopsies and things. And it was just easier to move the herd to St. Paul to be able to do all of that kind of stuff that they wanted to on a more intensive basis. So. Uh, we, we moved the herd to St. Paul. And then I'm, I'm curious about one other thing, um, given where you're, you're based. I know you work with some graduate students. How does it work if, if they're working at your site and probably have to take courses on the main campus? So we make it work. I, I, it, 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 it can be tricky sometimes. So a lot of my graduate students, their projects are here in, in Morris. Sure. Some are in the summertime, uh, but they do travel between... Uh, St. Paul and Morris. It's about two and a half hour drive. Uh, we have housing here so they can come and stay and collect uh, whatever they need to collect. So okay. uh, we make it work. And I, I go to St. Paul a lot too. So there's lots of travel between students and myself and uh, it, it works out. Okay. Um, we make it work. And I think the grad students sometimes appreciate getting out of the big city and yeah. working with cows here. So it's... Uh, it, it, it works. It works. Good. Well, uh, there's a few things I wanted to zoom in on today for our conversation. And one area that's attracting increasing attention, I believe, is calf housing. So there's a lot of diversity out there across farms in terms of whether cows are housed individually, the sort of the traditional way, or more paired housing or even group housing with automated feeders. And then even within that, there's lots of variation about if they're pairing, when do they get paired and that sort of thing. So just talk me through, if you would, a little bit of the work that you're doing in this space, what questions you're asking. Sure. So it, you know, it really started when, when I, I started here 10 years ago or so. Uh, the herd here was group housed with calves. My predecessor, who who's, was Dennis Johnson, he sort of moved to group housing at the time. And I, I stayed with that. I, I like that. You know, I grew up feeding calves individually and we, we all might know how much labor that can be or crawling into hutches, you name it. Um, and then I sort of moved into a, a, an automatic feeder uh, capacity here where I, I got some uh, grant funding to, to put in an automatic feeder to sort of expand the number. You know, we were group housing calves in 10, groups of 10. Okay. And I'm like, well... You know, I've read a lot from New Zealand where they're, you know, some of those herds are feeding 50, 60 calves together in a group, which is, uh, you know, kind of wild. Yes. But, um, so I thought, well, 
you know, let, let's move it further. So that's where we got into the auto feeder type aspect and working with more larger group sizes. And then, you know, probably the biggest question that I was getting, and it's still happening in the industry is why do we take calves away from cows? And so that sort of led a, a couple of us here uh, to uh, get funding for a project to compare calves that were raised on cows in, in a dairy herd to calves that were raised individually, pair housed calves, as well as group housed calves. So we sort of wow. wanted to do it all and <laughs> <laughs> see what would happen, uh, you know, full knowing that some in the industry um, are moving away from individual housing. You know, there's, you know, there's lots of, you know, California is, is maybe moving away from individual housing and, or has some propositions going on. So there's a lot of things that are happening in the industry right now that I think we need to be at the forefront of instead of, you know, being told what to do. We need to research these options and see, see what happens, uh, you know, when, when we can compare them. So that's what we did at our, our research center is we had all four of those housing systems for the last two and a half years. Oh, wow. Um, so it's, it's been a fun project. We just kind of finished up the last calves in February of this year. Um, and we, we raised over a hundred calves on dairy cows and we can talk about how, how we did that. Uh, but then, you know, we had about a hundred in each of the others. So a hundred calves that were raised individually, a hundred in pairs, uh, and then a bunch in groups. So um, we looked at many different aspects from growth, health, you know, colostrum management, uh, passive transfer, behavior we had sensors on them oh you name it we we tried to cover it all and i think it probably we 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 found more questions than we did answers probably in, in what we did which is i guess what research is about wow i had no idea you had that magnitude of study going so one i've got a couple questions one of them is um i was just in a session with an extensive conversation on paired versus individual housing at the Western Dairy Management Conference and cross suckling, uh, you know, I hear it many times, but that was probably the number one topic uh, concern. And there, to my understanding, there's a lack of long term data on um, tracking those heifers that have been put in different calf raising scenarios into first lactation and seeing if you actually have it increase in number of blind quarters and that sort of thing. Are you guys tracking that? Is that an outcome in the study? We are, we are tracking that to see what happens. And we have tracked, you know, if we notice calves that are cross sucking and sometimes we've had to put wieners in their nose to you know, yep. get them to stop. So I, you know, we, we've seen it there. There is no doubt that we have it. I think it's at a really low level, Okay, you know, a, a few calves here and there. And, you know, I wouldn't, necessarily say we we've seen some individual calves do it too so it's it there there we're i'm not quite sure on the behavior dynamics of that you know when when we group them we take them out of the individual hutch and put them with a larger group and you'll see that happening in in individual calves too uh, i don't think it's any more prevalence in the group calves or individual calves uh, that we've seen i sort of have a philosophy about that sometimes i think some people agree with me some people don't i think sometimes cross sucking is from because we don't feed them enough uh, don't don't feed them enough milk you know in this study we were feeding uh 10 liters a day so two and a half gallons uh, per day per calf so we were feeding a lot of milk yes uh, uh, you know high milk allowance obviously the calves that were raised on their mom were drinking way more than that right um or at least we kind of guessed that they were drinking way more than that um but i think if you know if we feed them enough uh i think they they probably don't have as much cross sucking you know when i when i started here there was probably a lot more cross sucking because we were only feeding you know at one and a half percent of their body weight and 
probably a lot less and we've increased milk allowance a lot in the last 10 years. So I obviously I don't have any data on that kind of stuff, but that's what I've kind of seen from our research and heard from other farmers too about cross sucking in group situations is we feed them enough and give them grain and have water available. I think we have a lot less cross sucking than what we might think there is. It's there, obviously yep. a concern. Yeah, that's typically the story I get too, is if, yeah, if we feed them enough, it'll be less of an issue. So I, I would love to hear a little bit more about how you did manage the the calves staying on the cows. How long did you do that? How did you manage the cow? Did you, you know, how many times a day did you actually milk them? So when, when they were born, we left these, these calves uh, with the cow. We, we allowed them to bond for about three days just to make sure that that cow would, you know, accept that calf. Mm -hmm. All of them did. We, we never had a problem. You know, we had older lactation cows that had never raised a calf in their life, you yeah. know, five, six lactation cows that were accepting calves and raising uh, wonderful calves. So we had it from, you know, first lactation cows to older cows doing okay. this. And after bonding, then we kind of grouped them together uh, with other cow calf pairs. Um, in, in kind of the winter time, they were in a, a bedded pack barn okay. close to our milking parlor. In the summertime, they went to pasture. So they, we allowed them to go outside, outdoors on pasture with mom. We milked those cows twice a day. Um, so we, we brought them up. That was one thing we learned was uh, when they're in a barn, you can separate the cows and the calves. When they're on pasture, I think the calves need to come up with the cows uh, to milking because otherwise mama gets a little, uh, you know, I wouldn't say ornery, but, you know, they're wondering where their calves are if they don't come with, you know, they're very, they, they have that mother mothering ability. It's, yep. it's there. Um, but we did milk them twice a day. You'll, you'll, it's interesting. And we're, we're still going through the milk production data, but you'll find that those cows are milking, you know, 30, 40 pounds in the first few weeks of lactation because that calf just isn't, you know, consuming that much milk. But when they get closer to dry off or sorry, weaning, you know, we wean these calves at nine weeks. Uh, so 63 days. And some of the cows didn't have any milk when they would come in, you know, starting at about week six. Uh, and some of the milkers were like, you need to call these cows. They don't have any milk. And, you know, it's we, we still brought them into the parlor, even though they didn't have any milk, just to see, you know, being able to record that. So the calves were drinking all the milk from mom. Wow. And stealing some as well from other cows. So they, you know, these calves were smart. They could figure out who wasn't uh, drinking enough or who was producing more milk. So they would go steal milk. You, sometimes <laughs> wow. you'd see two calves on one cow uh, uh -huh. doing that. So there's, uh, it was quite interesting look, looking at the dynamics of that. And, you know, some of these cows, after we wean the, the calf, you know, they would come back up in milk production. Some would bump right back up 50, 60 pounds. Some, it was a little lag there. It took a while and some, you know, maybe some first lactation heifers didn't recover as well and maybe kind of plateaued about 30 pounds of milk. So it was, all of them were very different. It was quite a, an interesting thing to see. You're a genetics guru. So, I mean, <laughs> let's say for the sake of argument, we, we get to a place where that's, that's sort of a requirement. I mean, do you think right. we can select cattle with the genetics to allow them to sort of be able to produce a lot of milk that we can harvest, you know, even though they're nursing? Well, I think we could uh, use genetics to, you know, have more production from the cows. You know, we, we sort of figured that these calves were drinking somewhere between 14 and 20 liters of milk per day. So, you know, eight gallons of milk uh, per day when they got closer to weaning. So that's where we really need to to look at, uh, but I think we can. You know, we're our our herd here at the research center is, you know, we're about eighteen thousand pounds of milk, so we don't we're not pushing them. We're kind of the pasture based herd yep. in the summer, so um, we you know we didn't try this with a hundred pound cows right. and, and to see what would happen. 
uh, it would be very interesting to do that to see what would happen in a yep. sort of freestall scenario, uh, uh, high production cows to see to see what would happen. I don't, I really don't know. I don't know what would happen if those cows would not produce to their potential or or what might happen. And one last question on that: in the bedded pack scenario in the winters, no, did you? Did you have any concerns or did you see any problems with calf injuries? I don't know what your stocking density was or anything. Uh, we, we didn't have any injuries. We usually normally grouped them about 20 cow-calf pairs together in kind of a larger barn. They had a lot of space okay. um, to be able to handle that. So I think if you provide enough space, you know, that's that's always a consideration is now you got to have more space for, for these cow-calf pairs uh, to do that. Uh, we didn't really have many injuries, um, you know, many issues They they're, they're in the environment that the cow is. So, you know, they're exposed to probably a little more sort of disease, I, I guess sure. you could say, you yeah. know, they're in and amongst the cows. And, um, so it, there are some considerations to think it's not that everybody needs to do that. I think it, right. There, there's ways to do it. And there's a lot of things to think about when, when that happens, uh, trying to raise some calves on cows. So it's, a, it's interesting topic. I'll, I'll tell you that. And I've got lots of questions about it, especially from even, you know, individual and pair housed and, and group housed. And, you know, I, I, we, we kind of started this project during the early parts of the the pandemic in 2020. So mm -hmm. I was feeding a lot of these calves at night. Uh, it, you know, I, so I was doing the physical work and, oh man, I've, now I remember why I don't like feeding calves individually. <laughs> <laughs> you know, nothing against that. There's a lot of people that do that, but, uh, oh man, I, it's I, a lot I of work feeding when you're, when you're doing them all together at the same time, it's like, oh man, I, it takes me, you know, five minutes to feed 20 calves this way. And it takes me, you know, 25 minutes to feed a few calves this way. So it's, you know, I think labor is the biggest factor in, in all of it. Yep. Well, I, uh, I'm glad you guys are doing that work. I'll be anticipating all the uh, publications from that and, and that, that we can all learn from that. But uh, on another topic beyond housing, um, appropriate management of disbudding of calves has also been sort of a, a topic of growing interest can you fill us in a little bit on your work there? So we, we've we also been exploring uh, disbudding in calves uh, from a pain management perspective. You know, I, I work a lot with uh, organic producers, uh, you know, grazing producers. You know, there's a lot of pain mitigation that's not really allowed in some organic herds. Uh, you know, like meloxicam isn't allowed, different things like that. So that was sort of where we we framed it from was, you know, are there other methods that we can use for pain mitigation, some, you know, natural things compared to lidocaine and, you know, it's, <laughs> there's a lot of things that are, are promoted out there that probably don't work as well as even just lidocaine or, you know, we're, we're working with some meloxicam as well to, to do that from a pain mitigation standpoint. So, um, I don't, I think the, the, there's a lot of answers yet that we don't quite know on how to appropriately manage pain in, in dairy calves. Um, I, we, we, we're, you know, kind of a crazy part of the project as well is, well, we don't, we we have horned cattle, so we didn't dehorn some of our heifer calves. So now I got twenty heifers running around here that have horns, and they're just starting to come into production now as well. So, you know, we're looking at those dynamics, and and that that's crazy. You know, you know th that's stuff that people did in the fifties and sixties where they left horns on animals. But there are some herds that I know that don't dehorn because they don't want to you know, inflict pain on their, their calves. So we're, we're looking at that too. I don't, you know, there's a lot of implications that go with horned cattle. It's, it's not easy. Do some of them have big enough horns that lockups are an issue? Yeah, they are. Yeah. 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 Yep, they are getting into cattle shoots. It's really a, 
you know, I was helping my graduate students the other day trying to put some sensors on these cows and oh man, it's, it's really difficult when they're trying to go into a chute. And so that's probably the worst part of it. Uh, we haven't seen any problems so far with them hurting other cattle or, or anything, but, um, you know, we're, we're looking at all of those aspects to it uh, as well. You know, we're kind of exploring pole genetics. That's, you know, kind of the geneticist in me is, yep. is kind of moving more towards pole genetics. So, you know, I'm, you know, supervisor of the dairy herd here and, and can pick the genetics. And so we're, I'm moving, we're using some pulled bulls, uh, probably about four or five right now. And because our, you know, full-time employees don't like to dehorn, yeah. you know, I don't like to dehorn. It's just one of those procedures that you do that I don't think anybody likes to do it, but knows that you probably have to do it. So as long as we can find ways to mitigate pain, that's, you know, I think we're going to have to do that and, and move to pulled genetics and which the industry is doing. I don't, I don't spend a lot of time thinking about, you know, Holstein genetics. Um, my understanding at this point is basically the problem with going that route is obviously you have a lot less selection, you know, a lot less bulls you can pick from. Right. I mean, that's the major issue. Right. It is. Yeah. It, you know, at one time, some of those bulls were probably a little more inferior to others, sure. and, but now there's, there's good high genetic bulls okay. that are pulled and that's what people are starting to use. And, and that's what we're using in our herd. So I think it's, it's coming. And I think there'll be a lot more pulled genetics now available than uh, what there was in the past. So I, you know, there's, there's some milk processors that are, are moving that way that say you have to at least use some pulled genetics in your herd. Uh, so it's, I think it's coming. Okay. It's coming. And yep. we need to be on the forefront there too. Yep. Makes sense to me. I did want to touch on uh, one other thing before we run out of time. So you mentioned that the center you work on uh, is is based as a grazing dairy system. And um, I know in my region, at least, there's a lot of sort of controversy in the rural communities about solar projects and other bioenergy projects. Um, but the main controversy is concern about these projects taking up lots of prime farm ground. And my understanding is that you're doing some work on at least considering agrivoltaic systems in combination with grazing dairy production. So help us understand that a little better. Right. So you, you see that in Minnesota here, a, a lot of solar installations taking up prime farmland. Mm -hmm. And I am not a big fan of that. Yeah. I'm pretty vo vocal about that. And I think there's ways that we can incorporate livestock with those solar panels, you know, if a solar developer puts up a solar installation, they have to be able to manage it, you know, either mow the weeds or mow the grass or, or you name it. So there were some farms here in Minnesota that were using sheep yep. to, to sort of graze, which is very popular in a lot of places, but uh, Minnesota is not a big sheep state. So it's like, we got all these dairy cows and, and beef cattle, especially. So why not try and raise the solar panels up uh, eight feet off the ground and can we graze under them and and not take away prime farmland and kind of have a dual use uh, to that so that's what we've been working on here as well so we have two solar installations one a small one and one kind of a little bit bigger that we're uh, you know grazing some of our cows under looking at what it what the cows do to the ground how does it benefit the cows from, you know, a heat stress perspective in the summertime? And we've published that research and uh, showed that we can, if we use some solar panels, we can, uh, for shade, we can reduce heat stress in, in grazing animals. So it's been quite popular. And I, you know, I, I work in extension too. And I, th I think right now I'm getting three to five calls or emails a week about agrivoltaics and can we graze cows and you name it under under solar panels so um even work working with some crop farmers now they're like can we grow so corn and soybeans under those too oh. so it's it's coming uh, you know it's it's moving fast uh now that you know it's like instead of taking away the prime farmland well maybe we can just farm it and and make it work so we're we're exploring a lot of those different aspects too it's kind of fun you know as a geneticist i didn't really expect to get into yeah. renewable energy when i started so it's it's kind of a new topic and and kind of a fun one that we're we're kind of dabbling in so it's it's good 
way to keep learning, right? That's great. Exactly. One thing exactly. I, I was curious about, part of me would say, okay, you, you are by necessity taking away solar radiation that drives plant growth. On the other hand, not as sure about Minnesota, but most of the U.S. in August, you actually have too much sunlight and it's actually right. causing. So have you guys done any work to sort of get at total, you know, uh, growing season yield of grass in that situation? Yeah, I have a graduate student that's actually working on a project like that now. So we're we're looking at different grass and forage species grown under okay. solar panels. So we have some plots and we're we're looking at what grasses or forages do the best, what their yield is, forage quality. Uh, so a lot of different stuff that that's happening there. And I should say some species are doing better than others. Sure, uh, you know there there's some definite variation in 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 forages when it comes to raising under solar panels. So it we're we're going to do that another year here and and see what what we can find. But um, yeah, we're working on that, and that that's one big question as well. Okay, well, what what can we grow under there? And uh, we're we're trying to answer that question too. Seems like a lot of what you're doing is what I would call systems research. Like, how how do we take ideas and how do they fit in the big picture of an ag system? And that's so important. There's not many places that are equipped to do that, really. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Fantastic. It's time for our famous three. Your partner in improving animal performance, Berg and Schmidt. They provide high quality, economical feed ingredients for ruminants like their well-researched coated nutrients and fat powders that can support cows with additional available energy, which improves their overall health, productive performance, and your cost efficiency. Our Yeast 40 is a natural biotechnology from ICC, designed to boost the health and productivity of animals under challenging production systems. Our Yeast 40 performance is supported by an unique processing technology that results in a pure product containing high levels of beta-glucans, MOS, and yeast metabolites. These factors, combined, promote the ruminal and intestinal modulation, helping the animals to reach their full potential. Okay, one thing that's kind of a tradition uh, on these shows is to try to get people in a little bit of trouble. So, <laughs> So uh, what's something that you believe that most people would disagree with? Well, I guess you could say two things. One, jerseys are the best breed. Okay. We, 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 we can argue about that. What, one thing is, you know, based on our research is I'm not entirely sure anymore that we need to pull a calf away from a cow immediately after birth and force colostrum into it. Okay. You know, Based on some of our research, it kind of shows that if you let the calf suckle on the cow, it provides adequate antibodies. We, we, I'll tell you, our, our serum proteins are higher in our calves raised on the cows than they are in ones that we raised individually or pairs or groups. So it's kind of changing the dynamics of thought. And even in my process, it's like, you know, maybe we don't need to do that anymore. And maybe we should, you know, let the calf suckle the cow for three days and get that, you know, second colostrum or, or you, you know, third a colostrum that those cows have. I think, I think the cow was made to do that stuff and we maybe discount the cow a little bit. So that might be a little controversial. I've gotten a few raised eyebrows when I've said that at different meetings and people are like, oh, you don't know what you're talking about. But I think there's something to it. Um, I think and, it's a, you know, the jury's out, but I, I don't think if I asked a lot of the calf nutritionists, they'd tell me I'm crazy thinking that way. I'm not, I'm not sure if you're familiar with it, but some of my colleagues here at Michigan state have published some work just in the last year or so on that transition milk. And it was all from calves pulled off of cows, but they gave them, you know, day two and day three milk. And it really did have some very clear impacts. So I think you're on, you're on to something there. Okay, we've got three final questions we always ask of every guest. It's been really interesting to see what people answer. So first one for you, what's your favorite dairy-related book or resource? You know, I, I think it's the tried and true. I like Horde's Dairyman. Yeah. You know, it, Horde's Dairyman, you know, I've been reading that since I was a teenager, and I still read it and subscribe today. And it just, to me, it provides a lot of the what's happening in 
in the dairy industry and you know we it's hard to catch up on everything all the time and it so it gives a, a good breath of of what's happening from shows and show cows to real world situations so i you know i i appreciate hordes dairyman uh in in Great. many different ways many different ways all right what about your favorite book or resource outside of agriculture you know this was it's an interesting question, and I, I kind of think back to something I read, actually, in graduate school, and you probably haven't heard of it. So it's called The Last Lecture by Randy Pouch. She's a professor at Carnegie Mellon, I think. So, it, you know, he was diagnosed with cancer, and it's sort of, you know, achieving your dreams, and, you know, did you achieve the dreams that you had when you grew up, or, you know, how did mentors affect your life, you know, lots of different things that really made you think about what, what is the real reason that, you know, you or I are, are doing work in the dairy industry, you know, what's it all for and, and who helped us throughout our, our careers to get here. And so I think that that's been um, a very interesting book and, and, you know, you can watch the lecture actually on YouTube or whatever too. So it's, I'd, I'd have to say that's one that keeps popping back into my mind uh, every so often. And that's I kind of go back to it once in a while. That was impactful to some people here at Michigan State, I know, because they have a they have a tradition where a lot of people, a lot of different departments on campus, you don't have to be near to death, but if you're about to retire, they'll have you do your last lecture kind of inspired by that. So that's good. All right, last question. In, in your opinion, what sets successful dairy professionals apart from those who are less successful? Oh, that's a good question. <laughs> you know, <laughs> what, one, I think, you know, I, I might be a traditionalist, but I, I think hard work sure. is, is one of, of those attributes, you know, work, working hard, uh, caring about the industry, caring about the customers that, that you work with, you know, whether it's dairy farmers or the dairy industry, uh, being honest with each other, uh, in, in all of our aspects. And probably the, the, the one thing that, in my mind that I thought of is, is caring about the end product. You know, how do we make that product nutritious for the consumer and, and who else, you know, is, is going to buy that. So I think even though we, we might think about, you know, if we're going to feed cows or be a veterinarian or whatever, you know, we have to be thinking about the, the glass of milk in the end and yeah. how do we, um, you know, make that the best it can be. And that ties in with your favorite book you mentioned, right? Understanding your, your purpose and uh, thinking about that bigger bigger role, right? Right. That's yeah, great. I agree. I agree. Well, Dr. Hines, thank you so much for your time today. I've enjoyed this conversation, getting to know about a lot of different things you have going. It sounds like you don't have a lot of days where you're sitting around bored looking for something to do. <laughs> no, not at all. Not at all. I have good students. I have good students. We all know that. Yeah. Our, good, our students help too. So You bet. You bet. Well, this has been another episode of the Dairy Podcast Show. Thank you for joining us in this conversation. And if you haven't subscribed yet, don't forget to hit that button so you don't miss the next episode. Till next time, thanks for joining us.